For thousands of years, female psychic ability was revered, nurtured, and honored from the temples of Inanna, Ishtar, and Isis to the Babylonian queen of the night. Then came the Romans, who imposed their male-dominated teachings on the world through politics and violence. After centuries of torture, witchcraft trials, and science that only understood part of reality, we, as women, ceased believing in our own ability, and for 2,000 years, female psychic talent lay demonized and abandoned. But maybe the ancient priestess teachings of eternal life, reincarnation, were part of the original Abrahamic religions. This is the story of a musician who went in search of the truth which led him, after years of difficulties, to the wisdom of Sophia. It was 1956, Manchester, Halloween, dark misty night, and a miracle happened. And then when I was nine years old, my family moved down to London into a pretty heavy working class area called Wimbledon. And this is where I first heard a flute played really well. A young guy came to the school and that was it. Classical flute, my whole life, sorted. A couple of years later though, I was sent to Hogwarts. It was black gowns, prefects, detentions, canings. They were trying to bully us into unquestioning obedience. Most of the boys just seemed to grin and bear it, but for whatever reason, I couldn't. I just began answering back. I was going out with a girl who lived here. Her father was always trying to get me into jazz, but I was strictly classical and not interested. Then he put on a record of John Coltrane, and I felt shockwaves going through my body. It was like uh, I had to find out everything about him. One afternoon, I was walking home from Hogwarts, pretty depressed kicking my school bag down the road when I heard an amazing sound coming out of one of the houses. It turned out to be William Bennett, one of the greatest flute players in the world. I banged on the door and after a pretty nervous audition, he agreed to teach me. By this point, school was getting really bad. Detentions raining in every 10 minutes. Finally, a teacher got so angry, he began smashing a heavy book into my head time and time again, screaming at me to obey. So one of my classmates moved in to protect me. I have to thank Stephen Harker for that. Two weeks later, I was expelled. After I got thrown out of school, every day I'd lay on my bedroom floor listening to Bach, Mozart, Schubert and John Coltrane. I felt like I was a student of them all. I'd been learning with William Bennett for a while when he sent me on a music course to hear a friend of his, James Galway. The door opened, a young guy came in with a great big caftan, a beard. He looked a bit like Hagrid from Harry Potter. I was looking at him thinking he's never going to be able to play and I picked up the flute and the most incredible sound came out of it. Over the next few years, both Jimmy and William Bennett became great mentors and friends. I was 18 years old and I went to the Guildhall School of Music, but I was stuck between two completely different styles. One was the classical side that I'd grown up with since I was very young, and the other was the whole Coltrane, Miles Davis jazz side. And I could never really resolve which one I was really trying to do, until a friend of mine said, would I write him a piece? And I managed to combine the two different styles into one form of music. And it was my first piece I wrote when I was going here, 
It's called Out of the Cool. Now you would think that uh, a young guy writing music that came from jazz and classical that was very, very different to what was going on at the time in 1975, that the professors at Guildhall would have been excited, but far from it. They took me into a room and they said, now look, you know, you, you cannot start writing this sort of jazzy music because uh, the powers that be will not appreciate that. You must write in the accepted style, otherwise you will not be played at the BBC proms and you will not be played by any of the state-sponsored orchestras. Anyway, I was just thinking, well, look, I'm writing the music that I believe in and I'm going to do it, what the hell? So I started writing my own music and actually I, I was very lucky that I met Nigel Kennedy, who's a, another complete heretic, and he took my music on and started playing it all over the place. And uh, gradually over time, uh, it became influenced by Celtic music, natural sound, Jimi Hendrix, studio technique. James Galway premiered my flute concerto in the Royal Festival Hall with the Philharmonia Orchestra in 1993. And a few years before that, Jerry Dammers asked me to play on a free Nelson Mandela single, so I've always felt a big connection to the great man. In 1985, cellist Caroline Dale commissioned a piece, and as I was writing it, I had very disturbing visions of a young girl burning alive. She was slowly rising out of her body, and the image haunted me for years. Caroline premiered On Fire in the Queen Elizabeth Hall in 1986. I'd been asked to write for the church many times, but always avoided it. It just never felt right. 
And the underlying narrative was always the same as school. It was unquestioning obedience. But something happened that changed all that. A young boy, Paul Medrington, who came round to play with my kids every day, died in a freak accident. Everyone was in shock. But a few weeks later, every time I thought about him, a strange sensation came over my body. I began to hear words and Paul was saying that all there is at an atomic and subatomic level is infinite love. Then I wrote a second kajuda for James Galway that he played in 2000 and the day after the performance we were having breakfast and he said, hey Dave, you know, I think you should start reading the Bible. Well, because it was Jimmy and because I've loved his playing for so long and I loved him as a guy and he was like my mentor, I thought, okay, you want me to read the Bible, I will. So I started from the very beginning and uh, to be honest, I was shocked. What was going on in Deuteronomy about women being stoned to death and Abraham is going to sacrifice his own kid and have his head chopped off. And I just thought this is, this is really shocking. And in fact, it upset me so much, I started ripping the pages out and throwing the Bible against the wall. Till it came to the New Testament, which seemed to be very, very different and almost like nothing to do with the Old Testament at all. And the more I looked into it, the less I understood what was going on. I followed the Daniel Pearl story very closely and like the rest of the world was deeply shocked. When Anne 
out of the blue, I got a call from Daniel's father. He wanted me to write a piece in Daniel's honour. Having spoken to Daniel's father several times and having written the piece for his son, I now felt personally connected to 9-11, that with the whole world in religious conflict, I felt whatever it took, I must find religious truth, I must get right back to what the original Muhammad, the original Christ and the original Elijah were actually talking about. My quest became more than an idle interest, it became desperate. I was reading religious texts all day long and arguing with scholars of all religions. My life was imploding. I even blew my stack during an archbishop's sermon. He began saying something I just so disagreed with. I shouted out, got dragged out of the church, and then I was taken to various psychiatrists and I managed to argue with them too. Eventually, in total frustration, I decided to try working out my own theory of existence, that maybe gravitational force is the attraction of atoms to increase their consciousness. That seemed to make a lot of sense to me, that God would exist at a subatomic level and exist in all things but I didn't know if that was true or not. Then I was in Paris in a cafe and I noticed this woman staring at me. And as I walked past, she said almost under her breath, what is this truth quest you're on? Well, I was a bit taken aback, as you can imagine. Then I sat down and shared my atomic theories with her. And she just smiled and said, well, that's pretty much what's said from the other side. And if I went round to her house the next day, she would channel for me. Well, I'd never heard of channeling. I'd never even been to a psychic. I kind of rejected it all because I thought, well, if it's scientific, people must have looked into it. And it wasn't true. So I went home and I rang up a few Christian friends and they said, don't have anything to do with it. It's witchcraft. It's evil. It'll lead you down dark paths. But by this stage, I was so desperate. I really didn't care what happened to me. If this was a way of finding truth, I was going to go for it. So I turned up at her place. And she was very matter of fact. There was no sort of mystical balls and strange things. She just sat down and said, oh, I've got to feed the dogs in. Oh, I'll probably be out for an hour and a half. Blah, blah, blah. And then she went into a very deep yogic trance. And then from the other side, they said to me, well, you can ask any question you want. And I, of course, started off and I said, well, who was the original Christ and what was his original teaching? Christ was a great practicing yogi who studied in India for 18 years expansion of the mind to allow healing of the body. He was a political revolutionary as well as a great spiritual thinker who taught his followers how to open the crown chakra to channel light. He was opposed to revenge, an eye for an eye, which creates such terrible political and social suffering. His teachings on reincarnation, of fulfilling a soul's destiny, were done in great secrecy, as those in power did not want to give this type of individuality to this huge population they had to control. After I first spoke to Sophia, I walked around, felt like the top of my head had blown off. I was thinking that if psychic power was real, that meant that much of history, science and religion were all wrong. After I calmed down a bit, I decided to put what Sophia had said under the same scrutiny I'd done with all the other religions. So I reread the Bible, looking for hints of reincarnation, maybe something the Romans had left in by mistake, and blow me down. In John's Gospel, Christ is clearly saying you must be born again many times, reincarnation, that you were born of spirit and body, and the spirit chooses where it wants to go.
Reincarnation is a learning process. You come back to gain more compassion and understanding by experiencing humanity in all its variety and richness. Your past lives exist at a cellular and subconscious level. You can't remember them, but they are part of who you really are. Here we are in the south of France, in Salon, which was the last residence of Nostradamus, the world-famous psychic who seemed to be able to see in the future. His prophecies are extraordinarily accurate. But there's some facts that make me wonder exactly what the truth was. When he was young, he couldn't do any prophecies. When he married his first wife, he couldn't do any prophecies. And suddenly, he marries his second wife, Anne Ponsard, and he seems to have these extraordinary revelations and psychic visions that he never had before. And there's something else. He says at the beginning of his prophecies that he looks into a bowl of water and he messes around with a few things and then he says the Divine One sits nearby. Now, what does he mean by that? Who is the Divine One that's sitting nearby? And I think that Anne Ponsard was the real psychic and he was covering up for her because it would have been too dangerous. She would have been a witch and she would have been dragged out of here and burnt alive. With that thought in mind, some of Nostradamus' verses do sound a bit like Sophia. L'Esprit divin fera l'âme félice, voyant le Verbe en son éternité. The Divine Spirit will bring joy to the soul, seeing God in his eternity. I wanted to find out who exactly I was talking to? Who was coming through Sophia? You are talking to Sophia, but the information is coming from her teacher. It is a type of relaxation of the mind to enable her to channel divine light or goddess energy. As Sophia relaxes her mind, she is regenerating her body. This is the fountain of youth that all are seeking. Every atom is multidimensional in terms of time. It exists both inside and outside time. Every atom is a unique, infinite universe striving for greater consciousness. How can time exist and not exist? I was thinking about someone on a running machine and they run a mile. But the point is, have they run a mile or haven't they run a mile? Well, the answer is they have and they haven't. It depends which side you're experiencing the run from. And I think time may be very similar uh, on the other side. So in other words, they're looking at us and we think time's moving, but actually it's moving in a very different way to as we're experiencing it. So running machine, although it's only a very simple explanation, that may explain how things can and not be happening all at the same time. One clear night, I was with a friend and looking through his telescope and I was thinking to myself, I wonder how many galaxies there are. I wonder how many stars there are. I decided to ask Sophia and see what she said. It goes back to mathematics, it is infinity, and this is the great beauty and joy of existence, that energy cannot die or perish, 
And like the human mind, which is limited and believes in finite ideas. The crossing over is a joyful experience. It is a celebration of one's life. They are without the constraints of identity. It's the ability to connect to the sound, the rhythm, laughter, joy, and this feeling of dance, which mirrors all that is occurring on a molecular, atomic level. Constant movement, chaotic yet chaos with a plan. After death, it takes time to travel through the ten austral planes to the vision of God in the tenth sphere, the three multidimensional circles which are at the core of everything. They represent the mind, body and spirit, the sacred geometry of the constructs of the universe. The Mobius Strip, a continuous circle which can be made into one, two, three interlocking circles, demonstrates how time can exist in the same place, present, past and future. I began experimenting and found that if you cut a Mobius strip down the middle, it starts producing linked circles. And I began thinking that maybe what Sophia was saying was this is how space, time and matter are all linked at a subatomic level. That what Sophia was sharing with me were the keys to the universe. And I began to think more and more about Mary Magdalene, that maybe the resurrection was that Christ spoke to his disciples through a woman of great psychic ability. The Saviour is saying that he is free from the bonds of space and time. He's released from earthly desires, that he is at one with all that is, like the seasons like time itself. He exists in an eternal now, in stillness and in peace. Legend has it that Mary Madeleine escaped to the south of France where she lived in remote mountain caves. I began to wonder if she carried on living there in subsequent incarnations, so I went down on a Magdalene quest to find out. And would you believe it? Esclamande de Foix was known for her psychic power, as was teenager Esclamande de Perel, who was burnt at Montségur, and later Marie de Nano, who lived at Rennes-le-Château. On my mystical travels, I met Pakistan's first supermodel, Sufi Islamic scholar and filmmaker Atia Khan, who was a follower of Sufi mystic Sheikh Nazim. Her film, Calendar Code, Rise of the Divine Feminine, documented her 18-year quest for divine female wisdom. Atia was also fascinated by Mary Magdalene and her links to the south of France, so we agreed to meet at the Church of Mary Magdalene in St. Marie de la Mer, where she met the spiritual teacher, Mary Jesus Sandoval. Shakti and Shiva and uh, Jesus and Mary and Ali and Fatma, that the, in, from my tradition, the Kalandri tradition, they believe it's the same couple reincarnating. It's the divine feminine coming together and telling everyone, you know, don't fight, we don't kill our children, you know. Don't fight, and also don't fight within. Reconcile with oneself, not only on the belief level, but also by healing memories we carry in our bodies at a deep cellular level. The relationship to touch is a language 
we need to reconnect with in sexuality, in friendship, we can find a vocabulary of love, peace, protection and gentleness at all levels of relationships. You don't have to have a belief. You just have to experience it. As women, we can go back to the state of being in our mother's womb. Then we can hold hands, support each other, and feel the bonds of sisterhood. Of course, the original Mary Magdalene would have been very strong and empowered, and some of her predictions would have seemed totally crazy. I guess that's why she was so controversial. I mean, telephones, aeroplanes and the internet, trying to describe them 2,000 years ago. Maybe that's why the Romans got the wrong end of the stick. They just couldn't make any sense of Mary Magdalene at all. I think Mary Magdalene would have been gregarious, free-spirited, artistic, totally empowered like the ancient priestesses of Ishtar, Inara and Isis, who sang, danced, painted and generally lived life to the full. They also all had a big connection to Venus, the goddess star. And that intrigued me. Why? What's so special about Venus? to the goddess energy where beauty in the form of color, sound and music is energetically enhanced so there is a direct vibrational resonance between Venus and the earth. As Venus passes the earth its gravitational pull alter space and time and enhances creative feminine energy. If you gave all women their Venus power, it would endanger the dominance of the male. You are asking these questions because your soul's quest has been that of an alchemist and spiritual seeker metaphysics and we see you as a Cathar in the south of France. Yeah. 
I researched the Cathars. 250 of them were burnt alive in 1244 at Monsegur Castle. Their objection to certain sections of the Old Testament and sticking to their heretical beliefs come what may, it certainly rang a bell, although in my conscious mind I had no memory of it. I began to remember being a teenage boy at Montségur, of knowing a young blind psychic girl, Esclamon de Perel, the only youngster who had been burnt in 1244. I got the feeling Esclamon was the young girl that I had seen burning that had inspired my cello piece, On Fire, 30 years before. Great music opens up the crown chakra to receive divine energy. To channel, you have to let that feeling go further until the whole body is connected. The human mind and body are made to channel, to see outside linear time. And all creative people have a natural understanding of what is a much larger energy it's the possession of knowing, connecting to the unseen.
And the purpose of life is to be at a level of non-judgment. For through non-judgment comes the ability to connect to the true vibration that is love. But something more huge than selfish love it is non-judgmental and unconditional. And the purpose of human existence is to finally acknowledge in a conscious state the oneness of all. Reducing Mary Magdalene to a prostitute plummeted civilization into the dark ages. It is time for truth to be revealed and consciousness to rise. After speaking to Sophia for over 12 years, I understood that the wisdom of Sophia, reincarnation, was an essential teaching missing from all the Abrahamic religions. And I've come to the conclusion that Elijah, Christ and Muhammad were probably all incarnations of God's messenger, teaching a very advanced form of Tibetan Buddhism. But how do you share that without causing offence or unhappiness to followers of deeply held beliefs? Well, that's what I've attempted to do in this film, and I hope you've got something from it. Shakespeare wanted art to enchant, wanted us Caliban, as he called us, to work together to create our dreams, a caliphate of light. So I'm giving it my best shot, and that's all we can do. We shall overcome one day, we shall overcome.
we shall have peace in all the lands. Eka cholo rei.